I think we're on air. All righty. So today, I know we had a little bit of an invite snafu, so it's just the three of us right now. Um, we're going to talk about plugins, though, right? Yeah, we're going to talk about the new log storage and log streaming plugins. Last uh, month or so, we've been doing a lot of work um, making logging a pluggable point in Rundeck. Uh, this has been something that users have asked about. They wanted to store the output outside the file system. This especially comes up for people who want to run in the cloud or who want to have multiple run decks in like an HA type of configuration. Hmm. So there's been a few reasons that we've been wanting to do this. And now we want to show how you can create your own plugin. And we have some examples that we'll show. And there's really two kinds of plugins that you can create in this new logging system. One is log streaming, so as every message comes from the execution, you can send that off to some other backend service to process it. And then the other one is log storage. At the end of a job execution, you can take that output and store it wherever you want and share that between other run deck instances or other tools. So it looks like we've got the log plugin development page. It's a new page. All this logging stuff is going to be in the 1.6.0 version of Rundeck. We're bumping this from a 1.5. This is a pretty significant improvement. So we're, we're making that a 1.6.0 release. And you can try all this stuff if you check out the development branch and or go to the build.rundeck.org page. You'll see there's a CI build that you could experiment with all this stuff. So, Greg, you want to say a little bit more about the uh, the documentation you're showing there? Sure. So, the the Rundeck documentation, uh, which is available on um, Rundeck.org, uh, this is a, a this is the newest uh, 160 documentation. Um, but we have two sections in the in the user manual, or two sections in the documentation about plugins. If you're if you're just looking to see how to use plugins. It's under the user manual. There's a chapter called plugins. Um, it describes the different types of plugins and how to configure them. Um, and if you're looking to develop plugins, you can go to the developer guide and there's a couple different chapters about the different types of plugins. Hi guys, looks like we got some people joining. Um, so anyway, the, uh, the logging plugins, there's uh, there's basically two ways to develop them. You can either write a Java-based plugin, which is kind of a standard mechanism we've already had for other plugin system for the other plugin types. Um, and then we also have Groovy-based plugins, which is a, a simpler way to write plugins. For the Logstash um, plugin, uh, it was pretty easy to create. Um, basically, I, I wrote a, a Groovy script which. Um, uses the uh, Rundeck um, DSL to, to declare the plugin um, uh, the plugin points, I mean the plugin um, methods and so on. Um, and then you can drop that into your, your Rundeck plugin directory, um, configure your connection information in your framework.properties and tell, tell Rundeck to use that plugin for uh, streaming your logs. And then at that point, you just need to set up your log stash to have a, a listener for a TCP, a, a, a TCP listener on a certain port, and then, then start log stash. So I guess as a quick demo, um, I have log stash running here. I have, I have run deck running. Um, right now, there's nothing in log stash. And if I log into Rundeck, uh, um, any, any is to log stash. So I ran a simple command, echo hi. Um, if you go to the console and log stash, I can see the message coming through. And um, if I if I search the uh, the Elasticsearch database, I can see these events that came through. The, the interesting thing about this is that it's not just the, the text from your, uh, your output, 
you click on the event, you can see all the metadata that Runnet provides. So we have things like the execution ID, um, the server, the user who ran it, the link back to the execution itself. Um, so all this gets logged into Logstash, which gives you uh, an easy way to search your logs and connect it back to your run deck. Um, I have a script which I'll run. Just echoes some more output. Just wow. Um, a, like a longer amount of output will appear. So it, we printed out some data. If we redo our search in Logstash, we can see all this content. We can reduce. We can narrow the array by by focusing on a particular execution ID. So if I did click here, I get this execution ID one. Two, which is the one ran, and see all the output there. So that's that's kind of the basics of it. Um, right now, I have this plugin defined in a gist, but once we have one six zero released, we'll put put that onto GitHub. Um, and that's 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 as easy as it gets. Um, if we want to look at the code a little bit, basically, <clears throat> I define a Rundeck plugin for this particular type, the streaming log writer. I declare a couple um, closures in Groovy, which are like methods if you're not familiar with Groovy, to, to define the op how the plugin operates. Um, when Rundeck starts an execution, it will look at the, uh, the plugins that you've configured to use. It'll call open on the plugin. So in this case, I, I take the host and port that I've configured, create a, you know, open a TCP socket to, the, to that endpoint, and um, set up some Java objects that I want to reuse in the later calls, including the socket. When an event comes through, like your, your uh, workflow outputs some text, um, Runic will call the add event closure. And uh, both of these are passed some metadata about your execution, so you can use that data however you want in your in your streaming log plugin. In this case, I build up a map of, of some data, which includes the timestamp, the message, etc. And then I write it to the TCP socket as JSON. So I'm serializing the JSON and writing it to the socket here. And finally, at the end, I, I write a little message saying the execution finished, and then I close the socket. And uh, that's a pr pretty simple way to pipe all your, your log data to another system. Yeah, not much code. Now, one thing when you showed me this code, Greg, that, that might be helpful is that um, the context.write, you have the, uh, in, in that map that you return, you have that write element in there. I didn't see that at first, but if anybody wants to know where that, that came from, that's where it's coming from. It's coming from the context, which is the map. Yeah, to be clear, the, when, you, when the, uh, the stream is open, run it calls open, and your, your code can pass back a map of, of data that you want to retain to all the subsequent calls of your plugin. So in this, in this plugin, I I include the, the TCP socket, some of the metadata, and a little bit of code that I can reuse, which which writes data to that socket. So that's what I'm using in the uh, add event closure to write the, um, the, the the data that I create for each event. Yeah, and that, and this was just the style that you picked because it's a very uh, quick groovy like way to uh, yeah, it's a, that. It's, it's a groovyism. Yeah. So. <clears throat> There's not an opinion about how you write this kind of plugin. It's just this is how this one was written. It's just an example. You could you could uh, design it your own way. But those are the three methods that it expects to have or mm -hmm. closures, I should say. Yeah, and if you're if you're writing Java, um, the interface is pretty similar, um, just more Java-like, which uh, with a defined um, interface class that you have to implement. All right. Yeah, looks pretty simple though. Yeah, so I guess I can I can talk next about the um, the log storage mechanism. Uh, maybe you can demo that, Alex, with your yeah. log dev. But so so um, 
I guess to describe Rundex logging system a bit more, it's all in this documentation that we'll, we'll publish with 1.6.0. But uh, when an execution runs, um, all the all the output from that execution is piped through the the log writer plugins if you, if there's any configured, and then finally into the the log file itself on disk, which is also now optional, but um, by default that's how it works. In 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 this log, log stash demo, I'm I'm using both. Um, when I when I run the job or run an execution, the output goes through the plugin. But it also gets written to disk, and that's how I, I can see it in the um, in the GUI here, and download it later if I want. Um, but you can you can change that configuration. You can add multiple writer plugins if you want, um, and then disable the file system if you want. But um, <clears throat> part of the part of the impetus to to create this plugin system was to make the file system less important for storing files. Uh, or for storing log output, because if you have, um, say, two two Runex servers pointing at the same database, and you execute a job on one and not the other, then the output file won't exist on you know the other Runex server. So when you try to view it later, you won't be able to get to it. So we introduced this um, log file storage plugin, and basically this is uh, an asynchronous way of Taking that log file output that Runex produces and storing it somewhere, and later if you're if you're trying to read it from a second Runex server to retrieve it from that system so that you can see the output. Um, it's also a way to back up your log data or to store it in a, a, a more central place. Like S3 is is the prime example. Um, if you have Runex running in in AWS on EC2, then you want all, maybe you want all your logs to be stored in S3, um, and actually I, I have written an S3 plugin which we'll also publish with 1.6.0. But when the way it works is you configure your Rundeck to enable a particular file storage plugin, and then after the log file is written for an execution, it gets uploaded through that plugin, and then later if, if it needs to read a log file and it doesn't exist locally, it can download it from that plugin. So Alex, Alex do you have uh, Yeah, I've got a simple example. Want to demo? Yeah. Let's screen share here. Also, for, the, for uh, the guys who just joined, if you have any questions, feel free to shout them out or type them in the chat or you have a particular part of the plugin system you want to want us to talk about? Let us know. Okay. I don't know what screen you can see. Actually, I'm trying to get this. I see my screen through your screen. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, do you see my render page? Mm, I see your Google Hangout page. Okay, there's a run neck. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'm bringing up a bunch of browser windows in here. All right, so let me first explain what people are seeing. I am. Um, I'm using Vagrant to set up a multi-node environment. So I have a MySQL instance where I'm going to store all the execution and project data, and a web dev instance which I'm using to. Uh, give this example about how to use that log store plugin to save all the execution output between the different run deck instances. And then I have two run deck instances, run deck one and run deck two. I'm calling run deck one the primary and run deck two the secondary because this vagrant configuration also shows uh, how to do some failover. So we're, we're working on some examples of failover here as well. And uh, that was really one of the reasons I wanted to try this, this web dev uh, server was a, a way of sharing the log output between the two run deck instances. So without this, you, you would have to use some kind of like shared file system, which isn't very friendly in the cloud and also not very uh, desirable in a data center. So 
let me just bring up this other window. I've got here's a a browser going to my my DAB that I set up. It's, this is just an Apache server with mod DAB enabled. It, it's really nothing more than that. And you can see that there's this directory of rundex slash project slash examples. This is how I've defined the path to store the log files, but you'll see that this is configurable, how you lay out the files. And here are the files that are currently stored in, in the web dev. So let's let's try this out. So here I am on run deck one. If you, uh, if you recall, here's run deck one and the IP address is dot four. So I'm on the dot four run deck. And uh, actually I'll just I'll just run a command here. How about uh, the ID command? And it's uh, completed and displaying the output. This is the first time I've run this since I started it. And uh, anyway, so it, it's showing the output. Now if I go back over here and I reload the page, you can see 12.rd log just appeared. Okay, so now I'm going to open here and go to the dot and uh, look looky there there's our command that I ran on run deck one and if I view output what it's going to do see now it's actually retrieving the output from the storage and um, there it is so what you're seeing there is two run deck instances sharing a database so that's why you can see the the metadata about the execution from either run deck and the web dev store being used in the middle to distribute the log output. Now one thing that we want to say about this is Rundeck takes that log output and stores it on the file system. You can think of it like a cache. So if it's if that log storage server is not there and the file is still on disk, it just reads it off disk. And if it's not on disk, it pulls it from the log store and puts it back on disk. So it tries to stay efficient like that, and it's also good, you know, if you're thinking about it from the way Rundeck works now, you'll see uh, it'll look familiar, except that you have this this off off box way of storing the output. So let me show you what the implementation of that looks like, and it's really just one source file. I called it the Web Dab Log File Storage Plugin. And you can see there's some annotations and so on here that describe this. Uh, this plugin is going to be called the Web Dab Log Store, and a little description. And here I am declaring my class. Really, all it's doing is it's implementing a few methods from this interface called the Log File Storage Plugin. And uh, here, all these annotations about plugin property. This is this is how you declare a parameter to your plugin. So when you want to configure your plugin. And, it, and your plugin might need to know what's the URL to something, or maybe credentials, or API tokens, or any of those kinds of things. You declare that as a plugin property, and that's how you configure that thing. Now, I mentioned that the path to where it gets stored in the web dev is configurable. This is similar to how the S3 plugin store works. So I basically just stole this code from that example. But it has these uh, these variables that lets you um, define how you, you you organize the output by project or execution ID and so on. But the guts of it really amount to the three methods that, uh, that are implemented. One is the store method. So in my example I'm using this web dev client library called Sardine and basically when it gets this input stream which is the output uh, from the, the job, it, it does something with it. So in this case, what it does is it it uh, defines a path to where it's going to store it in the web dev, and then it creates that collection if it doesn't exist. So it creates that folder structure in the web dev that you saw earlier. This is where that happens. But this is really the meat of it. It takes the, the stream and uh, stores it in that location in the web dev, and that's about it. So that's how it is to store it. Another method is is available. So this is the check that Rundeck uses to find out is it in the log store. So when you're 
looking at the execution output, this is where this method gets called in to find out if it's there. And, uh, and then finally, if it is there, then the retrieve method can be used. And the nut of this thing is just sardine.get, so that just gets a get on that location. The rest of this code is really just setting it up, you know, uh, initialize, looks at those, those uh, configuration tokens, and then there's ways of processing that into a path. But the rest of this is just kind of a little support code uh, around those three main methods, store, is available, and retrieve. So it's pretty simple um, to implement. It didn't take me that long. Actually, it took me longer just to find the web dev client that I wanted to use than actually implementing it. I thought it was pretty painless. Greg, is there anything else you'd add to somebody who was interested in writing one of these or maybe configuring? And I could show what the configuration looks like. Um, maybe you could post the, the GitHub link. GitHub link? To yeah, the, to that code. Ah, good idea. Uh, do that. And it's currently under my my own account, but we'll move this. This will be another one of these examples that we'll move over once uh, one six zero is uh, is wrapped up. Okay, so I kind of lost my. Yeah, and I also just pasted links to the um, the Logstash plugin in that gist I had, and then to the S three plugin I, I have on GitHub. Okay. Right, so there's there's an introduction to the log store stuff. The other recent uh, contribution was another plugin of the notification type. Yeah, move on to that unless there's anybody wants to ask about the the log storage plugins. Um, this this plugin was contributed um, by somebody who works in a development team, and they use HipChat. Which I hadn't used before. Um, I saw this plugin, and uh, but basically it's a it's a chat service that people use, you know, to collaborate on whatever they're doing across the world. And what this does is um, takes advantage of the notification plugin in Rundeck. So I've got a, another Rundeck here somewhere <laughs> hiding. Uh, over here it goes. I think that it is. Yes, this is the one. So, no, that's not the one. There it is. Uh, this. There we go. So this is another Rundeck instance here. And you can, I'm showing this uh, very simple job called Hi. But what I wanted to draw your attention to was this, the notification setup here. So you can see that I'm just experimenting with it. So on failure, on start, and on success, each each case uh, is going to is called the is going to call the HipChat plugin, and the HipChat plugin basically needs just two things: the the room you want to send the message to, and the API token to uh, to access that service. So if I run it, I'm just going to go ahead and run it. Pretty much just does its normal thing, but behind the scenes, what's happened is it's it's invoked that that HipChat notification plugin. So let's go over there. The hip chat, and here's my my chat room called Rundeck, and here we go. See, I just we just saw this happen here. I just ran this. Let me do it again, so you can see it in in live. There it goes. Execution ID five. Um, now that's what happens when it uh, succeeds. But I've got a a job here which is made to to cause an error. So I, I, by exiting one. It, it just forces the job to fail. It's an easy way to do that. And I've got notification just on the on failure, because that's really I just wanted to show this this here. So if I run that, fails as, a, as I said it should. And then look over here, got a different color. The, the plugin author has colors for when started, fit, uh, succeeded, and uh, aired out. So it's I'm kinda, easier. I'm kind of impressed by uh, how fast HipChat picks that up and feeds it back to you. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, almost simultaneous, like half a second. So this is kind of useful. Um, 
I, I've, I, I hear a lot about in like DevOps circles how people use you know IRC or Campfire or in this case HipChat as a way of sending output and activity from all kinds of tools. So this is pretty cool. I now I feel more motivated to uh, to use something like HipChat instead of like our usual Skype and everything yeah. else that we use. We use we use too many different chat things and. Uh, mm -hmm. And so uh, maybe this will this will be an example of how we consolidate to one and organize all our our activity into the stream. It's nice to, especially like in a release or a big change event, to have a have a location where you can mix, you know, like human human commands like "Hey, so and so, it's time to you know uh, to reconfigure that switch," and then to see output coming from that back into the window where somebody you know said to do it that I think that really helps kind of trace later on you know how everything went down yeah so anyway setting it up on hipchat was was a no-brainer I just went into the API tab and I just created a token that's all I had to do here I named it and uh, and so from there on out you just drop that that plugin into into run deck and then when you write your job uh, actually this is how it if I edit the job it kind of shows off the configurability of plugins in Rundeck. So the author uh, declared two config properties, one called Room and one called API Token, and they just show up here. So this is nice for plugin writers who need to get this kind of info from uh, the job editor, job creator. Um, they can specify whatever number of parameters they need to talk to that, that notification service. So that's generally true for for the Rundeck plugins that, that show up in the GUI like that. All right, anybody want to say ask questions about the notification? Um, actually, my, one question might come is uh, what other example notification plugins are there? Um, Greg, you I think you had some sample code for that too, right? That's a one five three feature, is it not? Uh, yeah, it's actually a one five one. So there's one five one. Of the uh, first for Rundeck on GitHub, um, there's an examples directory, and there's example code for all the different uh, plugin types there. There's a um, <coughs> Ruby notification plugin examples, um, which are pretty uh, pretty easy to do. Cool. Yeah, one one example is a. You know, one feature request we've had is a way to customize the mail notification because we have built-in mail notification. Um, but uh, with the plugin system, it's pretty easy to, to have your own mail notification. So uh, there's an example in there which does that for you. It gives you, actually, it's, you know, you could take that code and use that as a basis for a custom email plugin if you wanted to. Yeah, some people want to have a, a special template for the message depending on the job, for example. Mm -hmm. Or whether it's a success or a failure. So it, it's, a, it's a nice way of, of managing how you want to generate the, uh, the email <coughs> notifications. There's also a really simple um, Groovy plugin called the Shell Script Notification Plugin, and it basically lets you configure a path to a, a shell script and then of runs that, that script uh, when the notification occurs. So that's a really simple way to integrate it with any other kind of system. Like I know people have um, IRC built that way. Our IRC notifications, they just run a little script. Plug it, you can plug in the shell script notification plugin to, to run that script. So it's pretty mm. simple. Yeah, that'd be a good example for us to, to show off also. Yeah. OK. So, hey, Damon, so we've got a uh, little bit of a demo of the notification, log stream, and log store plugins. We could talk uh, more about that, or we could talk more about our plans for 160, or also some of the work that we're, we're planning to do in the next couple months. Yeah, there, any of you guys have questions uh, about plugins or... Have you written plugins or, or have you used plugins already? <clears throat> I 
No. <laughs> WinRM plugin. So do you uh, do you mostly uh, deploy to Windows or or target Windows in your Rundeck usage? Cool. Yeah, the winner and plug. So, our, uh, what what version of Rundeck are you using? Okay, cool. So, um, I know some people have had issues with one five and the and the winner and plugin. Have you guys run into issues with that? It's something that. Um, we know needs some more uh, love and care for sure. Okay. Can't tell what uh, is being displayed on the Google Hangout. Is it us or is this still my screen? I think it's whoever ta is talking. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's uh, you guys at the statement. I think it's whoever is talking. And also, um, I realize that I think the chat is not going to get recorded in the YouTube recording. So maybe we should, uh, oh, okay. if we are reading off the off the chat, we should. Uh, Repeat the questions or repeat the answers to so if somebody watches on the YouTube recording, but you know, let them learn. Yeah, so uh, Bradley said he uses the winner and plug in, and Chris said I'm going to start using it uh, on 153. No major issues, but uh, the only problem I ran into is the default timeout of 60 seconds had to adjust it. So, Bradley, did you have to patch the code? I, I don't know, I don't recall if that timeout was part of. The code or the configuration value. I see. Part of the code. So I guess that would make sense to have that as <laughs> something you can configure more easily. Greg, you want to? We could talk a little bit about the other work that we're are planning on getting into one six zero. I was thinking about that popular request to allow scripts to run as sudo. Oh yeah, you, you you've been working on that. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> so the run deck. So this is a feature of the SSH executor that allows you to um, invoke sudo and then securely provide a password to to uh, use it um, but that that only worked until now with the uh, the command steps so you'd, you could write a, a sudo command and it would it would work but it didn't work for the script steps so for 160 we're going to enable that feature um, and uh, really it just amounts to allowing you to, to define a way that your script gets invoked. Um, instead of just executing it directly, you can provide a little command line um, that will that will be run with the uh, script file as an argument to it. So in that in that way you can say sudo um, as your interpreter and it will it'll invoke it with that um, sudo 
<coughs> authentication mechanism if you've configured your node to use that. So that's a popular feature request that we're going to add in 1.6.0. Um, let me look at the uh, issue list here. So Bradley says, um, I added this line. Okay, so it was a is a over there configuration option that needed to be adjusted. Okay, that's cool. Hey, you should um you should file an issue on the GitHub uh, project and uh, hopefully you can add a configuration option to make that easier. And by the way, we're planning to have a 160 uh, release candidate build available sometime next week, hopefully Wednesday or so. Um, there was a couple little bugs that we're going to patch for 160. The the other the other item I'm working on. Um, is a tweak to change the way unresolved property references are, are expanded when you have a command line um, step. It, it used to be that if you had an option that didn't have a value and you had um, a dollar bracket option.name property reference in your command line, it wouldn't expand that and it would usually fail to run your, your command because it, the syntax fails running it on bash or something. And that is pretty much a, just a unintuitive behavior, uh, whether it's a bug, you know, or just a bad, a bad uh, default behavior is up in the air, but we're going to change that so that it doesn't have that problem anymore. That's another popular issue. <laughs> Chris says, "Yay!" <laughs> cool. Yeah, I think I think people run into that and they're like, well, "Why is it doing that? <laughs> why didn't it just put in a blank value?" Which uh, makes sense. Hey, one topic I was uh, going to bring up now, maybe for next time, is how we manage the project, how the life cycle of a project. This has been, uh, I think, kind of a loose end for us. Um, you know, you've got your job definitions, and you got option JSON data, and you have even project configuration. You might have scripts. You have all these things that that want to move along together in your in your life cycle, and so you want to maintain them in your source repo, and then you want to move them along kind of in lockstep. And Rundeck has sort of different ways to move those things, but not, not in a way that I think is friendly to the development life cycle. So we've been spending some time thinking about that, and I think where we're arriving is building on the, the ideas of the project archive, and also starting to think about project content as something that corresponds directly to what could go in an archive. And we'll, we'll have some more to say about that, I think, next time. We're, we're hashing it out now, but, it, but we're feeling good about it. We feel like this is going to simplify things. And we're working with a, a user who, needs, who also needs to do this, not just for their run deck tooling, but some other application code and configuration management code. So it's kind of a, a point of focus that, that we're taking right now. And I think that um, this might be a, a great place for, for people to, to give us some ideas or, or you know, make sure we're we're thinking about this in a way that that seems natural. Yeah, I think that'll help a lot with the you know software development lifecycle for people writing jobs and then publishing them to a you know production run next server <clears throat> and smoothing out that transition between you know development mode where you're iterating on. Um, how your jobs work and how things are configured, and then, you know, basically committing that to source and having that be the uh, the version that you run in production. So, yeah, that'll be that'll be very cool. 
Right, and there'll be some related work that goes along with that, like, for example, making sure that the way the job definitions get serialized is consistent every time. That way it'll yeah. be easy to diff, uh, you know, what you, what you stored in your SCM and what comes back out from, uh, from Runbeck without, like, some kind of weird random order to the, to the files. Um, but I think, yeah, we're... For us right now, 160, and, and hearing uh, people's thoughts on this new plugin, that will be great. Um, we'll be we'll be building on that, uh, like I say, for for cloud deployments and for HA type configurations is kind of an important ingredient to it. But I think that we we keep seeing how you know somebody sees an idea like that and then they apply it in a way we didn't imagine. So that, that's kind of exciting. So we're hoping to see uh, some cool stuff. Hey, Damon, we're just about up at the hour here. Anything else you, you wanted to say? Maybe we could talk about when we'll do this again. Yeah, no. Um, yeah, I guess I'm the coordinator here. Uh, no, <laughs> it's good. To, uh, except next time, I think we'll get this, we'll get this whole, uh, now we got the mechanics, now this thing actually works, we'll get the, the scheduling down a little, uh, a little better. Um, yeah, I, I, this topic came out of the last one we did, right? So anybody have any suggestions for, for the, next, uh, the next topic? Could be a different kind of plugin, also. This was the newest one, but uh, we mentioned the notification one, and but then there's some of the other ones like node execution. Um, yeah. Things things that come up on the IRC chat sometimes are about, you know, the, the SSH plugin that's built in, you know, works out of the box. But sometimes you need to do, I don't know, like use agent forwarding or or just you know you want to turn on or turn off certain options. Um, you know, so maybe even something like that. And whatever it is, uh, there's there's points of extension there in Rundick that we want to uh, we want to show off. Yeah. So if we're all, uh, anybody have any inputs on that? Or <laughs> maybe we'll just take it to the list. Yeah. <clears throat> And we'll have this YouTube video up there as part of maybe some notes about what we covered today. Yeah, sounds good. For those that couldn't make it. All right. Thanks, everybody. I'm hitting the uh, end, end broadcast button now. <laughs> Thanks for joining, everybody. Bye.